So yeah, I was saying that, that the lock and key model, uh, it has a rigid shape, only the substrate which is having the matching shape can only fit and the substrate is a key which fits the lock of the active site. So that's the basic concept of our lock and key model. Now let's check uh, apoenzyme and hollow enzyme. So So the apoenzymes basically is, is nothing, it's a non-protein uh, moiety which is termed as apoenzyme and it is inactive. So this is your apoenzyme here uh, which is having protein portion which are inactive, right? And there is a protein portion and another is a non-protein portion uh, which is act as an activator. So which leads to the activation of your apoenzyme. So once this apon this cofactor, this your coenzyme attached to the apoenzyme, it become a hollow enzyme, which is act as a whole enzyme and is active. So once this coenzyme or cofactor is attached to it, so substrate could attach and it could function as enzyme. Otherwise, it's of no use. So the apoenzyme without its non-protein moiety is termed as apoenzyme, it is inactive, whereas the hollow enzyme, which is active enzyme with its non-protein component. Further, uh, the cofactor, the cofactor is basically, the, here this we are talking, it's of two types, that is coenzyme and prosthetic group. And this cofactor is basically is a non-protein chemical compound, which is bound either tightly or loosely. So the coenzymes are loosely uh, uh, bound and your prosthetic groups are tightly bound with a covalent bond. So that's how they are having this difference. So coenzyme are the non-protein components which are loosely bound by the non-covalent bonds. Uh, examples are vitamins or compounds from the vitamins, derived from the vitamins. And prosthetic groups are the non-protein components which are tightly bound to the apoenzyme by covalent bond. It's called as a prosthetic group like FMN, uh, copper, manganese, iron group, all these, heme. So let's talk about now how enzymes are specific actually. What is the reason behind this enzyme specificity? How enzyme specificity really works? So there are varying degree of specificity for substrates. The enzymes vary like for different substrates, it will have different specificity. So they may recognize and catalyze a single substrate, a group of similar substrates and particular type of bond. So based on the specificity, it is divided into three parts whether it will find a single substrate, one substrate only, or number of substrates, or number of different kinds of bonds, or one particular type of a bond. So here we can see uh, three types, absolute, group, and linkage. So the absolute includes catalyze one type of fraction for single substrate, and the group are the catalyze one type of fraction for similar substrates. A linkage is the one type of fraction for specific type of bonds. Yeah. So absolute is a urease which catalyzes only hydrolysis of urea. Uh, for hexokinase which add a phosphate group to hexoses. And the linkage is a chymotrypsin catalyzes the hydrolysis of peptide bonds. So in this way there are three types of specificity of enzymes. Uh, beyond that uh, these um, enzymes, there are some other factors on which uh, the enzyme activity depends. Uh, so first is your temperature. Uh, temperature. Then second is your pH. Third is your enzyme concentration. And fourth is your substrate concentration. Right. So there are four ways that the enzyme specificity, enzyme uh, activity depends. How depend upon temperature? So normally all your enzymes, uh, they are activated uh, at their at our normal body temperature around 37 degrees Celsius. But if you increase the temperature of the body, they will be not working as good they should or even the body temperature get lower, then even the functionality of the enzymes will be slower. So up to a part of enzymatic reactions, 
which increases with increasing temperature because substrates collide with active sites uh, more frequently uh, when molecules move rapidly. So above that temperature speed of enzymatic reactions uh, drop sharply right and the pH uh, uh, it is like they are very happy to be around 6 to 8 pH uh, for their uh, working. There could be some exceptions also of course. So just as an enzyme has an optimal temperature it is also has a pH at which it is most active. So optimal pH is around 6 to 8 but there could be also exceptions. For the enzyme concentration point of view, so as the enzyme concentration increases, the rate of fractions also increases, right? So at very high enzyme concentration, the substrate concentration may become rate limiting, so reaction stops increasing. But once the enzyme concentration is, is very high, it will not work as it was, uh, it was working like before because of that, it will not attach to most of the substrates. So the reaction will be not as far as it should be. And from the substrate concentration perspective, uh, for a given enzyme concentration, the rate of enzyme reaction increases with increasing substrate concentration. But at high concentration, enzyme molecules become saturated, so adding more substrate does not make much difference, right. So that is how the four different also the activity of your enzyme depends upon. Temperature, pH, enzyme concentration and substrate concentration. So some important terms with regards to um, biochemical nature of enzyme. So we were discussing about activation energy on yesterday, that activation energy, how it, how it helps to make the enzyme, the biochemical reaction fast. So all chemical reactions, they require some energy initially, initially to get them started. So the first push uh, to initiate that reaction is known as your activation energy. The first push that is required to start your reaction is known as your activation energy. So enzyme helps in lowering the activation energy for a given reaction. So initially they lower this activation energy and make the reaction fast which enables the reactant molecules to absorb enough energy to reach the transition state. So what is the transition state here? So when molecules have absorbed enough energy for the bonds to break, the reactants in the unstable conditions known as transition state. So um, before we discuss about these activation energy in more details, let us have a quick review that what we have discussed about enzymes. So we have discussed that enzymes are of two types that is a hollow enzyme and simple only protein. The hollow enzyme or complex, they are combination of protein part and non-protein part. And it includes this hollow enzyme, apoenzyme and cofactor, where apoenzyme is your protein part, cofactor is your non-protein part. So this cofactor is of two types, prosthetic group and coenzyme. Prosthetic groups are inorganic molecules or atom and coenzyme is a large organic molecule. And they are usually tied to the apoenzyme and they are loosely bound to the apoenzyme. This is tightly and loosely. Now let us discuss something about enzyme uh, mechanism of enzyme action, uh, mechanism of action of enzymes. So enzymes increases the reactions rate by decreasing the activation energy. So enzyme substrate interactions, formation of enzyme substrate complex by lock and key model and induced fit model. So here uh, the activation energy thing that we were discussing. Uh, so here we can see a lactose is there without enzyme and we need to break this bond into glucose and galactose. So the person needs, this is the boulder like let us say this is the reaction that has to be happen and the person need to put lot of energy to make it to the top and this is the transition state like this one. Uh, after the transition state is reached, then it will go down and it will make the reaction happen. Then it is no problem afterwards to make the product. So this much from here to there, it is known as your activation energy without enzyme. And the blow one is the net energy released from the splitting of your lactose. And this is a reaction with the enzyme, we are having a lactase here. and and in the lactase we have added this lactose enzyme. So once the lactose is attached to its active site, 
it will produce your glucose and galactose and the best part is that the activation energy that it requires is just need little bit energy push and your reaction good to go and your reaction is good to go for example like hydrogen peroxide h2o2 um, in in uh, to break down of h2o2 hydrogen peroxide into h2o and o2 it requires around 86 uh, kilojoule per mole energy but once we have adding the enzyme called catalase so it needs only 1 kilojoule per mole uh, energy so that's how it decreases from 85 kilojoule of energy it doesn't require it just need 1 kilojoule of energy afterwards so that's how the enzyme uh, working it is that's how it lowers the activation energy the same thing is described together with the with enzyme and non enzyme reactions so this is your free energy and this is the progress of your reaction so this black one is a coarse reaction without enzyme and this is the reactant course of reaction with enzyme so this is a without enzyme enzyme without enzyme uh, this reaction and this is the uh, activation energy uh, lower with the enzyme so this is it's got decrease from here to there and this is the delta G energy which is not affected by the enzyme. So the summary of what we have discussed. So this lock and key model as we were discussing. So so this was given by M. L. Fisher in 1840. So as it says, it has a rigid shape that it only the specific uh, substrate will attach to the enzyme. So only substrate with matching shape can fit and the substrate is a key that fits the lock of the active site. So this is an older model, however, it does not work for all the enzymes. So, so the main point that we have discussed here that, uh, that as a specific key can only have specific lock in the same manner specific enzyme can transfer only specific substrate into products so according to this model the active site has a rigid structure and there is no modification of flexibility in the site before or during the after the enzyme reaction so once uh, it is attached during this transition state uh, no change occurs in the shape there is no in the enzyme substrate complex no shape occur change and then your products are produced so this was quite old model like in 1890 it was discovered but at that point that was the only uh, model that we had but later on induced fit model came uh, which was given by Koshland in 1959 yeah which was like let's say it's after 60 70 years you know till 70 years this model was accepted all over the world but after the seven years this new discovery was done by the uh, Koshland so the enzyme molecules are in active form uh, to become active, they must undergo slight change in structures to more specific to accommodate a substrate. So the active site can be slightly modified as substrate interacts with the enzyme. So here the enzyme substrate complex in this case, the enzyme is slightly changed, slightly improved for the better adjustment of your substrate. So this can be imagined like a hand glove relationship, like we are wearing a glove. Uh, so the gloves tends to change its shape for our hands so that it can fit properly. So that's the induced fit model says about it. So it has a flexible, uh, it, it is flexible and not rigid and the shape of enzyme is active and substrate adjusts to the maximum to fit it which improve the catalysis and there's a greater range of substrate specificity and beyond that this model is more consistent with the wider range of enzymes. So this was, this model was widely accepted in the world. So that's it student from the uh, mechanism, structure and mechanism part uh, that wanted to finish. So I have shared with this, uh, this document yesterday only. So now we can continue with the next part.
so this is the classification and nomenclature so in this part we will be discussing about how the nomenclature is done how the classification is done to discuss more about allosteric enzyme also uh, specificity of enzyme and feedback mechanism so we will discuss more about enzyme today in this So as we have discussed your nomenclature and classification, so it is divided into six different categories that is your oxyreductase, transferase, hydrolase, isomerase and ligase. So oxyreductase uh, which catalyze basically your what your redox reactions. So enzymes that catalyze the, the transfer of electrons from one molecule the reductant that is electron donor to the another oxidant that is electron receptor we can simply say that these enzymes catalyze oxidation and reduction reactions so examples are like oxidase dehydrogenase so dehydrogenase like which help in the removal of your hydrogen so this reaction we can see a lactate uh, with the help of nad plus and lactate dehydrogenase it uh, removes this h bond and only the double bond of oxygen is left and NADH is there. Another side transferases which helps in transfer of specific functional group from one molecule that is donor to another molecule that is receptor. So example could be kinases, transaminases, so kina these uh, kinases which helps in the transfer of your phosphate group that is your phosphorylation. So here we have a methyl group and we have this norepinephrine and there is a PNT, PNMT enzyme so what is happening is this methyl group is transferred to this epinephrine to this norepinephrine and it becomes an epinephrine then then comes your hydrolases so which cleaves the uh, hydrogen bond yeah, which involves the hydrolysis of compounds using the water so the hydrolysis is happening so water is getting um, your, your bonds are being broken with the help of water so breakdown is happening so for example are uh, uh, amylase protease peptidase lipases phosphatases and so on so here we can see a triglyceride with ch2 ch ch2 so these bonds that we are seeing here they will be all broken and the presence of three molecules of water and lipase enzyme so at then you have a glycerol and a fatty acid three molecules of fatty acids Further, the fourth one, the lysases, which catalyze the removal of group to form double bonds or reverse the double break bond. So basically, they are breaking various chemical bonds uh, by means other than hydrolysis and oxidation. So it's not that neither hydrolysis is happening, neither the oxidation is happening. So, for example, decarboxylases, in which removal of carboxylic group, carboxyl group, and form carbon dioxide or synthesis synthesizes so here we can see there is a fumarate with a double bond with the two carbons so with the presence of H2O it will break that double bond it will make into the malate further isomerases uh, they tend to change this shape uh, intramolecular rearrangement so they convert a molecule from one isomer to another so it facilitate intramolecular rearrangement in which bonds are broken and fo formed so example is like isomerases, epimerases, mutases. So isomerases tends to um, make glucose into fructose in the presence of enzyme glucose isomerase. Or in this case, we have three phosphoglycerate on the third carbon, your phosphoglycerate phospho group is attached. So in the presence of enzyme phosphoglycerate mutase, it will change this three carbon to two carbon, two phosphoglycerate. So it's changed the shape of your uh, like change the uh, the the position of your uh, group. Then comes last and not the least ligases, which catalyze a reaction in which uh, two carbon CS and CO CN bonds are broken. So they are also called as synthetases, catalyze the formation of different bonds by combination of two compounds. That is in condensation reaction that the ATP is formed. So example is your DNA polymerase, DNA ligase. So here we can see DNA strand is there and another DNA strand is there. 
So one has a hydroxyl group, one has your phosphate group. So they will go and tend to join together and the two DNA strands will be formed together. So overall we have discussed now in the classification of enzyme, six enzymes here, your oxyreductase, transferase, hydrolases, lysases, isomerases and ligases. So never ever forget them, there is always a good MCQs are coming an exam related to that regarding the functions, what they are doing, what is their uh, function is. So do, do remember all these, yeah, these six, six parts. Now comes the nomenclature and how the naming of enzyme uh, being taken place. So in most cases enzymes names ends with the A's. So my name is Simran at the moment. So I could be, my name could be uh, changed to Simranase if my enzyme has to be found out. Simranase, yeah. The common name for hydrolase is derived from the substrate. So you can remove the A at the end like for the urea and add A's in the end like urease. Or lactose is there, you can remove this O's and you can replace with the A's, that is lactase. So other enzymes uh, are named for the substrate in the reaction catalyzed. So like lactate dehydrogenase, pyruvate decarboxylase. Some others are there which does not have any relationship to substrates or reaction type like catalase, pepsin, chymotrypsin and trypsin. So little bit about activation energy, some little bit kinetics now, let's discuss this part. Um, so an enzyme speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy by changing the reaction pathway. So this provides a lower route of uh, energy conversations. So here we can see uh, there is a um, stoichiometry quotient of substrate A and there is a product with a stoichiometry quotient of product B. So K equivalent give rise to product raised to power stoichiometry quotient of that and reactant raised to power stoichiometry quotient raised to power A. So an enzyme speeds a reaction by lowering the activation energy changing the reaction pathway. So this provides a lower energy route for conversion of the substrate to the product. So every chemical reaction is characterized by an equilibrium constant K equivalent which is a reflection of the difference in the energy between A, A and product B, B and so on. So diagram of energy difference between reactants and products. So here we can see that there, there is energy uh, on the left hand side uh, on the y axis and the x axis is the progress of reaction. So your reactants from A plus B give rise to your product C plus T. So what we can see in total is the, the energy that is required for the whole uh, activation energy in and, uh, and, and uncatalyzed reaction is this much. But once you add a catal uh, enzyme into that, the catalyzation will happen. So your reactant A plus will give you product C plus T and you have E A at the end. So progress this will be the this product. So here we can see the uncatalyzed reaction has a large activation energy as we can see on the left and in the right the catalyzed reaction the activation energy has been lowered significantly and increasing the rate of reaction. Yeah. So that is the main difference between uncatalyzed here and catalyzed reactions depending upon your activation energy. Further how the substrate concentration uh, affect the enzyme catalyzed reactions. So the rate of uncatalyzed reactions increases as the substrate concentration increases. So in this diagram we can see the uncatalyzed reaction you have a rate of reaction going on and the substrate concentration is going on. Um, and on this side is enzyme catalyzed reaction your rate of reaction is going on on the left side as substrate concentration here. But in this case we see a hyperbolic uh, graph which tends to increase to one point and then there is saturation point. So it reaches the V max. So reaction reaches a maximum rate in this case. So in the case of enzyme uh, catalyzed reactions, which shows two stages, 
Now the first stage is the formation of enzyme substrate complex uh, which is followed by the slow conversion to product and the rate is limited by your enzyme availability. So enzyme substrate complex, so these reversible steps represent the steps in enzyme catalyzed reactions. So the first step that involves the formation of enzyme substrate complex includes your formation of your enzyme substrate complex. So E plus S enzyme plus substrate in the step 1 it will make an enzyme substrate complex. Then in the step 2 it will make a transition state and then next step 3 it will make enzyme product complex and in the step 4 you have enzyme plus product. So enzyme is the uh, EP is the enzyme product complex at then and hence you will have a product at the fourth stage. So the part of enzyme combining with the substrate is the active site and some, some, some characteristics about this active site. So these are the pockets or clefts in the surface of an enzyme and the alkyl group at the active sites are called catalytic groups and the shape of active site is complementary to the shape of the substrate and enzyme attracts and holds the enzyme using your known covalent interactions. So confirmation of the active site determines the specificity of the enzyme. So this we have discussed, I will not go further, this lock and key model. Uh, the enzyme has a substrate that fit to exactly and this model fails to make into account protein conformational changes to accommodate a substrate molecule. So there is no change in the enzyme shape here. Where in the induced fit model, uh, the enzyme active sites te tend to be very flexible and there are conformational changes happening to accommodate your substrate molecule. So if the shape of your enzyme is in this uh, C shape, V shape, it tends to change into this hexagon shape also according to the substrate. So transition state and product formation. So how does the enzyme promote a faster chemical reaction? So basically as a substrate interacts with the enzyme, it's shape changes and this new shape is less energetically stable and this transition state has features of both substrate and products and falls apart to yield product which dissociate from the enzyme. So what are the possible types of transition state possible? So here we can see in this diagram, this is enzyme plus substrate. So there are two uh, substrates having uh, two functional groups. So they will come and join to the enzyme and then uh, water will be one of the this, this uh, functional group that is water will be removed and then they will form enzyme product complex. Then after the enzyme product complex is formed, enzyme will, it will produce a product which will have the combination of your both substrate. So they will join together and one of the functional group of water is removed and they are joined together. And same way here glucose and fructose is there with the COH and COH group. So in this case also your water is removed and they are both are joined together. So this is the example of the same thing. That how it is happening in reality um, in the case of your uh, in the transition state how things are working. So enzyme brings two reactants into the close proximity and maintains the proper orientation. Third type is the enzyme might modify the pH of the environment, microenvironment and donating or accepting the pH. Now let's, uh, let's talk about cofactors and coenzymes that we just discussed in the mechanism of enzyme action. So here we can see that the uh, active enzyme, the hollow enzyme, it has to tend two things that is called apoenzyme and cofactor. The apoenzyme is your polypeptide portion of enzyme whereas the non-protein part is the prosthetic group that is your cofactor. So here we have this apoenzyme plus substrate uh, but you know it will not, apoenzyme is not active because it does not have a cofactor. So no enzyme substrate complex, no reaction will happen. But once the cofactor is there that is your uh, uh, copper, so functional group with active bending site, so substrate could attach to it. So enzyme substrate complex will form and the reaction will happen positively. So cofactors are tend to bond to the enzyme for to maintain correct configuration of the site. So metal lines, organic compounds, organic metallic compounds and so on. So further these co coenzyme, another uh, example here. 
uh, they are also required by some enzyme. So let's say here in this case, um, this is your enzyme E and you have substrate 1 and substrate 2 and you have coenzyme here attached in between. So substrate 1 having this functional group red, red in color F. So once they got attached to it, the, the, the cofactor, it will get attached to that functional group and transfer that functional group from substrate 1 to substrate 2. So once it is uh, transferred to the substrate 2, it will form a product 1 and product 2. So it will be a different thing that, that has been produced now. So the product 1 does not have that functional group anymore, but the product 2 has that same functional group now. So in this case, your cofactor is playing a very essential role as a messenger of it. So an organic molecule bound to enzyme by weak interactions of hydrogen bonds. So most coenzymes carry electrons or small groups. So many have modified vitamins in their structure also. So some of the water soluble vitamins and their coenzymes. So like thiamine, vitamin B1, which is a thiamine pyrophosphate, riboflavin, there is B2, flavin mononucleotide, flavin adenine dinucleotide, and niacin B3, nictomine adenine dinucleotide, and so on. So now let's talk about allosteric enzymes. So we have discussed uh, since morning various mechanisms of enzymes. We have discussed the classifications of enzyme. We have discussed how enzyme substrate uh, complex, the uncatalyzed and catalyzed reactions are different from each other from the graphical and kinetics perspective. And then we have discussed about various coenzymes and cofactors and we have discussed the importance of the transition state, how it is helping. We have discussed lock and key model and induced, induced fit model in details today. We have discussed, uh, yeah, this one also, yeah. So this, this is the so far the summary of today. Now let's take to the next section of allosteric enzymes. Cool. So the effector molecules that change the activity of an enzyme by binding at the second side. So here we can see this enzyme right on which the substrate are attached and there is an effector binding site also there is nothing is attached there. So once the substrate is attached it will make uh, two products one of them will act as a negative feedback factor. So it tends to get attached to the effector part and it will stop the active site it will close the active site and nothing could uh, make sense there. Nothing would make, make things happen here. So you will have your um, yeah a different stuff like it will not work anymore. So some so in this case these factors could be of two types one could be positive one could be negative. So the positive ones which will speed up the enzymatic reaction whereas the negative ones which will slow down the reactions. So the one which speed up the reaction they will be called as positive allosterism and the one which slow down the reaction that will be your negative allosterism. So in this case that we were discussed in this example is your negative allosterism. So allosteric enzyme in metabolism the third reaction of glycolysis places a second phosphate on fructose 6-phosphate. So ATP is a negative effector and AMP is your positive effector of the enzyme phospho, uh, phospho fructokinase. So here we can see this is a fructose 6-phosphate uh, and we have added this ATP into this. So it has one uh, tri, it is adenosine triphosphate. So in the presence of enzyme phosphofructokinase, it will give one phosphate and will attach to it making it to fructose 1,6-pi-phosphate and we will have adenosine diphosphate at the end. So here ATP is acting as a negative effector and AMP is a positive effector of the enzyme phosphofructokinase. Because if ATP is added, it will make 1,6-pi-phosphate but once we have added the AMP, uh, that is a monophosphate, uh, then it will take the phosphate group and become a diphosphate and then triphosphate. So both is possible. So there is a feedback uh, inhibition uh, mechanism is happening here. That is, uh, allosteric enzymes, uh, they tend to, uh, they are the basis for feedback inhibition. So with feedback inhibition, a product late in the series of enzyme catalyzed reaction serve as an inhibitor for previously allosteric enzymes earlier in the series. 
So let's say we having this substrate A, product B then, and C, D, E, and F. And in all these directions, enzyme E1, E2 are, are being used. But here F serves to inhibit the uh, activity of enzyme E1, which will make the reaction slow down. It will not go further. So F act as a negative feedback inhibitor. And same way, there could be positive uh, elastonism is possible. This may, might help in the fastening of the reaction. That will be then your positive feedback in him, uh, positive feedback enhancer. So in this example, we can see product F serves to inhibit the activity of E1, whereas the product F act as a negative elastoric factor on one of the earlier enzymes in the pathway. Right? And then there is a positive uh, elastorism, which is an example of elastoric activation, which is seen in the binding of the oxygen molecules to the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is composed of four distinct subunits, can bind up to four oxygen molecules, HbO8. So as oxygen molecules binds, it changes the conformation of hemoglobin and it increases affinity for oxygen. So this ensures that hemoglobin will transfer the maximum amount of oxygen from oxygen rich areas. So conversely, the release of an oxygen molecules decreases the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen, promoting its release in the tissue. So the proenzyme, so a proenzyme and enzyme made is in active form. So it is converted to its active form by protolysis. So when needed at the active site in the cell, pepsinogen is synthesized and transported to the stomach where it is converted to pepsin. Then further, proenzyme of uh, digestive tract. So there is a proelastase, trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, pepsinogen, and procarboxypeptidases. So these are all the activators are trypsin, 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 acid BH, trypsin, and so on. So some modifications of proteins. So in protein modification, a chemical group is covalently added to or removed from the protein. So covalent modifications either activates or turn off the enzymes. The most common form of protein modification is addition or removal of the phosphate group. So this group is located at the R group with free hydroxyl group. So it could be serine, threonine and tyrosine and so on. So inhibition of enzyme activity, so chemicals can bind to enzymes and eliminate or drastically reduce the catalytic activity. So they classify enzyme inhibitors on the basis of reversibility and competition. So there is irreversible inhibitors that bind tightly to the enzyme and thereby prevent formation of the enzyme substrate complex. And there is reversibility competitive inhibitors uh, often structurally resemble the substrate but bind at the normal active site. And third one are the no, uh, reversible non-competitive inhibitors which tend to bind at some place other than the active site. And this binding is very weak and inhibition that's why it's very, it's reversible. So let's take one by one each of the inhibitors. So first is your irreversible inhibitor. So irreversible enzyme inhibitors, they bind very tightly to the enzyme. So this binding of inhibitor to one of the R group side chain group of amino acids in the active site. So this binding may block the active site and binding group so that enzyme substrate complex cannot form. So alternatively an inhibitor may interfere with a catalytic group of the active site eliminating the catalysis. So examples includes arsenic, snake venom, nerve gas. Once they are inside the body, persons die, in, die instantly because all the enzymes their workings are inhibited instantly all the enzymes. So as I said, if enzyme is, is in our body, uh, we are working. If enzyme is not working in our body, we are not working. 
then comes your reversible competitive inhibitors so they are the one uh, with the competitive uh, they, they compete with the structure analog of a substrate so the molecules resemble the structure and charge distribution of your substrate of an enzyme so they they permits the inhibitor to occupy the enzyme active site and once inhibitor is, is at the active site no reaction can occur and enzyme activity is inhibited so inhibition is a competitive because inhibitor and the substrate compete for the binding to the active site here so degree of inhibition depends upon the relative concentration of enzyme and inhibitor in this case last not the least reversible non competitive inhibitors so they are the one which binds to the alkyl group side chain group of amino acids and to the metal ion cofactor and this binding is weak and enzyme activity is restored when the inhibitor dissociate from the enzyme inhibitor complex and these inhibitors do not bind to the active site and do modify the shape of the active site once bound elsewhere in the structure Now proteolytic enzymes cleave the peptide bond in the proteins uh, and these enzymes break the peptide bonds that maintain the primary protein structure and these enzymes specifically depend on the hydrophobic pocket so the cluster of hydrophobic compounds uh, may come together by 3D folding of the protein chain for example chymotrypsin which cleaves the peptide bond at the carboxylic end of it uh, methanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine so here we having this peptide bond between phenyl aniline and glycine so it tends to break this bond so some applications of these enzymes in medicines from the diagnostic perspective enzyme levels altered with the disease so it could happen that heart attack is possible with lactate dehydrogenase creatinine phosphate and serum glutamate oxalate and transmenase that is SGOT then pancreatitis that is your mylase and lipase then the analytical reagents enzyme used to measure another substance so urea tend to convert to ammonia via urease and blood urea nitrogen are measured and there is a replacement theory also by administered genetically engineered uh, beta glucosaribocytase for Gaucher disease so that's it student So share the session today with you. So tomorrow we will talk about little bit about kinetics of enzyme, how the kinetics is done, is a factor and modulator same. It depends on the reaction, how the reaction is happening. So it could be modified according to that. Okay, wish you a nice day students. Enjoy your day, make it productive, do the best. Spread positivity as much as possible. If there is negativity in us, that's also spread it. It's okay. It's not good to be always positive. Sometimes we can be negative. So accept it. But things will gradually be fine. And other than that, uh, work hard. Do it with your passion. And do it with honesty. And try to 
uh, reach near the truth. Whatever you are doing in your task, try to go as much as truth is possible near to that. Yeah, so that's the thing for today. Thank you very much. Yeah, God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye.